Hi Bobcats! In this video we're going to look at the particle origins of intermolecular forces. So the three intermolecular forces we're going to look at are London dispersion forces, which are present in every substance, dipole-dipole forces, which are only present in polar molecules, and hydrogen bonding, which is a special type of dipole-dipole that will be present in um, just a very small number of molecules. Generally speaking, intermolecular forces are attractions and even repulsions between one molecule and the next. So these blue dotted lines like this one here are illustrating the attraction that one molecule of carbon monoxide feels for another molecule of carbon monoxide. Um, I'm using the convention here that the black atoms are carbon and the red atoms are oxygen. Uh, because carbon monoxide is a polar molecule, there is permanently a very weak negative charge, which we show with the lowercase Greek letter delta with the minus, um, on the oxygen atom. And then over on the carbon atom in each one of these molecules, there is a very weak partial positive charge. And that's permanently, um, those charges are permanently there on these molecules because they are polar. And so one end of the carbon monoxide of any given carbon monoxide molecule can weakly attract the opposite end of any other. And then if say two um, oxygen atoms came close to one another, those two oxygen atoms would actually repel one another because they each have a slight negative charge. But in general, the intermolecular forces mean any sort of attraction or repulsion between one molecule and the next. If a sample has very strong intermolecular forces, it means that one molecule attracts another molecule within that sample very strongly. And because of that strong attraction, we end up with properties that we can observe for the substance, such as a high boiling point, a high melting point, or a high viscosity. But if we have weak intermolecular forces, we'll have the opposite. We'll have low boiling point, low melting point, and low viscosity. The three types of intermolecular forces that we'll be concerned about are known as hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and London dispersion forces. Uh, some textbooks just call these dispersion forces, and unfortunately there's a whole slew of names um, for this general category, including things like van der Waals forces. I'll do my best to try always to say London Dispersion Forces or LDF, but sometimes I uh, forget. In terms of strength, the London dispersion forces are the weakest of these forces, and they're present in every molecule. We'll see why in a couple of slides. Dipole-dipole um, is, is a little bit stronger, or actually quite a bit stronger than London dispersion, and then hydrogen bonding is even stronger than that. I'm going to start with dipole-dipole forces because I think these are the easiest to understand in terms of what's going on between particles. To have dipole-dipole forces present, the molecule has to be polar to give us that permanent a positive and negative end of the molecule, that happens because there's an asymmetric distribution of electron domains. So that means the electrons are not uniformly distributed through the entire molecule. And then instead, they tend to spend more time on one spot in the molecule than they do in another spot. So that spot where they spend more time ends up with a slight negative charge, and that spot where they don't hang out as much ends up with a slight negative, uh, slight positive charge due to the absence of those negative electrons. This happens when the atoms that are involved in the bond have a difference in electronegativity. So one of the atoms pulls on the electrons more strongly than another one does. And of course that final result is that you have a permanent positive and negative end on your molecule. And as we see in this illustration in the bottom right corner, if you have a positive end on one molecule, it can be attracted to the negative end on another nearby molecule. And in the solid phase, molecules tend to line up this way so that the positives and the negatives are pointed towards each other to maximize those forces of attraction. If you'll think back to chapter four, how was it that we determined if a molecule is polar or not? Well, 
first of all, we need to know what the structure of the molecule is. We need to know which atom is connected to which other atom, and in particular, what atom is in the middle of the molecule. We can do that by looking at either the Lewis dot structure or the Vesper structure. Then identify that central atom and count how many different distinct electron domains are on that central atom. If all of the electron domains are exactly the same, then the molecule will be nonpolar. When I say exactly the same, I mean even to the point that if it's a single bond, the atom that's on the other end of the single bond has to be the same. Or if it's a double bond, the atom on the other end of the double bond has to be the same for all of the domains. But if there's even one discrepancy among those domains, the molecule will be polar. So let's look at a couple of examples here really quickly. Take this molecule over here on the right, CCL4. The central carbon atom has four domains attached to it, and each one of those domains is absolutely identical. And so this will results in a nonpolar molecule. So over here, this is a nonpolar molecule. If we make just a small change to that molecule, now I'm showing the Lewis structure instead of the Vesper structure, this molecule down here, notice that we have four single bonds still, but we've changed atoms. On the top and on the right, we have fluorine atoms, but down on the bottom and over on the left, we have chlorine atoms. Since those atoms are not exactly the same, this molecule will be polar. So that symmetry has to be complete and perfect. Um, with these simple molecules for them to be nonpolar. And if there's even a small discrepancy, like one of the atoms is different from the others, it's going to be polar. Um, another example down here is water. And notice here, while we have a couple of single bonds, um, in addition to that, we've got a couple of lone pairs. So we definitely don't have four of the same things. Um, and so this will be a polar molecule as well. Uh, let's see, up here in the upper right, we have a molecule that's composed of only carbon and hydrogen. And if it's only carbon and hydrogen, the molecule will be nonpolar. Uh, just because there's the difference in electronegativity between those two atoms is so tiny that we treat carbon-carbon uh, or carbon-hydrogen bonds as being completely nonpolar. So that molecule there, which is known as benzene, will be if you throw some other atom in, like down here in this lower left corner, where we have a bunch of carbons and hydrogens, but we also have this C double bond O, well, throwing in that double bond O is going to make this a polar molecule. The next type of intermolecular force I want to take a look at is dispersion forces. This one, unfortunately, goes by a lot of names. Dispersion forces, London forces, London dispersion forces, Van der Waals forces, lots of different names. I will do my best to try to always use the phrase London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces are due to the random motion of electrons, so dispersion forces will be found in all substances. Let's say that you have a molecule whose electron distribution looks like what we have down here in the lower left-hand corner, where the electrons are randomly distributed and evenly distributed throughout the entire molecule for most of the time. But every once in a while, just due to the random motion of the electrons, you might have an electron distribution that looks something like this. So just for an instant, the electrons are spending a little bit more time, or, or uh, more electrons are for just an instant located over here on the left side of the molecule, making it slightly negative, just because uh, there are too many electrons clustered over there. And so what will happen in this atom or this molecule that's next to it is that since there's a positive um, a very slight positive charge located on the end of that nearby molecule, the electrons in the, the next molecule will be attracted. And so just for an instant, um, the adjacent molecules electrons get pulled over to the left hand side and we get this very weak attraction between the slight positive charge on one and the slight negative charge on another. But then in the next moment, 
the electrons go back to being randomly distributed. And that's how they spend their distribution, or that's how they are distributed most of the time. So this brief attraction is for just a very tiny fraction of the time. Most of the time, the electrons are nice and evenly distributed. Our third intermolecular force is known as hydrogen bonding, and this is really a terrible use of the word bond because it is not a bond, it's an intermolecular force. Bonds are, are the, the word bond is used to talk about attractions within a molecule, and intermolecular force is what we're really talking about with hydrogen bonding, where it's between one molecule and the next. It's an especially strong um, intermolecular force that can happen when a molecule contains a bond between either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and a hydrogen atom. It's actually a, that, that actually creates a very strongly polar bond, um, which for instance over here in these water molecules makes the hydrogen slightly positive and the oxygen on this adjacent molecule is slightly negative. And so we get this attraction between the two molecules due to the, those um, polar charges. Um, this is even stronger than our normal dipole-dipole interaction. So I usually refer to this as being a dipole-dipole interaction on steroids. Okay, so if hydrogen bonding is just dipole-dipole on steroids, why does it get its own special name? Well, this graph is trying to illustrate why that's the case. This graph is showing uh, the periodic trends in hydrides of uh, nonmetals and um, their boiling points. And you'll notice the three molecules that don't really fall in line with the lines for their groups, which are these up here. We've got water, we've got HF, and we have ammonia. These three molecules that fall way outside of the trends for their groups all are molecules that are capable of doing hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is the reason that the boiling points in these three molecules are so much higher than um, would be predicted for their groups because the hydrogen bonding makes the molecules in these samples attract each other so much more strongly that you have to go to much higher temperatures to separate them out of the liquid phase and convert them into a gas. The objective for this video was to describe the origin of the three intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and London dispersion forces.